Welcome to God's Truth. I'm your instructor, Dr. D. Todd Harrison, as we continue to flood the world with God's truth. What a great year this continues to be as we study the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And of that same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I testify as one of his witnesses that he lives today. He sits enthroned at the right hand of our Heavenly Father. He is our Lord, our God, our Savior, our Redeemer, our all. Let's study today what the Apostle Paul said about Jesus. And again, as we go into our lesson today, we remind everyone as we continue to study Paul is that it uh, doesn't matter what he may or may not have been. The fact is in Doctrine and Covenant section 18, verse 9, the Lord Jesus Christ nearly 2,000 years later after Paul declared that Paul was one of his apostles. Paul mine apostle it says so whether he he was considered by the 12 apostles in his day as a heretic as a as a, you know the proclaimer of false uh, false brand of christianity jesus considered him to be one of his apostles so let's keep that in mind always as we read paul and we'll see some more attacks today of paul against the president of the church the first presidency in the quorum of the 12th, uh, but nevertheless, again, keep in mind what's going on, right? As he goes out preaching what he believes Jesus told him to say, and apparently, according to Doctrine and Covenants, Jesus did tell him what to say. When he's going out preaching that you don't need to keep the law of Moses any longer now that Jesus came, remember that the first presidency and the Quorum of the 12 are coming after him. Every time he goes to a community, to a, to a congregation of the church, and preach that you no longer have to keep the law of Moses. Those from sent directly from the first presidency are coming to that same town, to that same congregation once Paul leaves, to tell them all that Paul's a false apostle, that Paul's not an apostle, that he has no authority uh, from Jerusalem, uh, that you should not listen to what he says, that he's preaching false doctrine, and that you need to keep the law of Moses, including circumcised yourself. So that's why Paul gets so furious, so upset all the time with them. He's always attacking them. At one point, uh, he gets uh, uh, he gets so bold as to declare that, uh, well, if they love circumcision so much, why don't they just go ahead and cut off the rest of their private parts? So we'll see that. Today, he's going to call the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve weak in the faith. They're the ones that are weak in the faith. So got to keep those things in mind as we explore the Apostle Paul. We looked last week at Romans chapter 1 through 6, and today we'll look at 7 through 16. And once again, Paul here in the book of Romans, as well as he's going to do in all his other epistles, continues to preach God's truth. This truth is totally 100% contrary and totally destroys current modern-day evangelical Christianity. They obviously don't read the scriptures. They obviously don't read Paul. Paul's their great champion. He's their man, their guy, because they like to take a few passages out of context. They don't even understand what they're quoting, and they quote scriptures to try to make it appear as though all they need to do is believe in Jesus Christ, and they can live their life however they want, and somehow they'll be saved by grace. But Paul, <laughs> if you just read just read it. It's totally against that false kind of idea. That is not Pauline theology. That is not New Testament Christianity. That is not Christianity. That is false religion. It needs to be condemned. It needs to be wiped off from the earth. And those who are guilty of propagating and preaching that false message of false Christianity need to repent, or they will one day face Jesus Christ face to face and be judged for their sins and be cast out into outer darkness where there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. We cannot warn any greater than that, any more clearer than that. You are in trouble spiritually if you are preaching that false gospel. As Paul himself will declare in Galatians, even if an angel comes and preaches a message other than what he's preaching here, which is that you need to live a righteous life and stop sinning. 
He has said it over and over again. He's going to say again today in today's lesson, he's going to start naming the Ten Commandments. You have to keep those Ten Commandments. If an angel from heaven comes and preaches that you don't have to keep the commandments, that you just have to believe, then let him be damned, accursed, is what Paul says in Galatians 1.8. Okay, great. So let's pick up here in chapter 7 of Romans. Uh, first here, he's going to um, uh, display himself and uh, as, a human, as a human here, and uh, you'll see his humanity uh, here. This is great uh, the verses here in chapter 7, 14 through 25. Let's look at the humanity, the, the human Paul here, Paul in his weaknesses and in his confession. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I don't allow, right? Sometimes we don't want to keep the, you know, we don't want to break the commandments, but somehow due to the mortal, uh, you know, the weakness of our mortal flesh, we do is what Paul's saying. So even even, even I, I want to keep the commandments, sometimes I still break the commandments. But what I hate, that I do, right? I hate sin, but I, I sometimes commit sin, right? Because of this mortal flesh, mortal weakness that I have. If then I do that which I would not, I can send unto the law that is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, right? I've acknowledged Jesus Christ. I've come unto Jesus Christ. So it's not really me sinning now, right? I'm going to receive forgiveness of my sins. I'm doing my best. That's all God expects of you to do your best. But you can't say you believe and go out and do whatever you want. That's not part of the gospel plan. You do your best to keep the commandments and the grace comes in and takes over and, and, and frees you from sin. He says, uh, now then it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. I really want to do it. I really want to keep the commandments. But how to perform that which is good I find not. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to control this flesh to fully keep the commandments. The Ten Commandments. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I seem to do. A lot of you are, you know, can 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 have, you know, feel with Paul right now, right? You all experience the same thing. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, when I want to do good, I end up doing evil. For I delight in the law of God, and I want to keep the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, in, in my members of my body, my physical body, warring against the law of my mind. My mind wants to obey the commandments and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my bodily members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, with my mind. And remember, and what did, did Jesus say in, uh, uh, you know, in the story about David, right? When they went to choose David, right? God does not look on the outward appearance. He looks on the heart, the heart and the mind. God wants to see in agreement to, with him. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. My body's obeying the law of sin, but my mind and my heart's obeying the law of God. Okay, so that's a, 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 you know, a, nice, a nice passage, a group of passages here. Okay, moving on to chapter 8, we'll look at 1 through 18. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You break the commandments, sin, uh, you, you, you commit sin, sin leads to death. But because of Jesus Christ now, we can receive forgiveness of our sins and receive life. For what the law could not do, now, again, the law of Moses, right? What the law of Moses could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law of Moses might be fulfilled in us 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is, em is enmity against God, right? The natural man is an enemy uh, uh, of God, as we get in the, in the Book of Mormon. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. For ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if it so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. You need to allow this spirit of God to dwell in you. Now, if any man does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. He's not his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, so the spirit of God dwells in you, he, God that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Ah, interesting once again, isn't it? We've seen this all the way through the Old Testament. We've seen it all the way through the New Testament. This idea that God's love is conditional. He does not love everybody as, as people like to say in the streets and in the news media and everything. God does not just love and tolerate evil. It is conditional love. It has been preached over and over again. If, if you're joining us now, just start back with the Old Testament. Our 52 videos of that, looking at those passages, all the 30 or so that we've done now in the New Testament just keeps coming up dozens upon dozens upon dozens of times that God's love is conditional. Here, he goes a step further, doesn't he? Not only is God's love conditional, but your sonship, your daughtership of God is conditional. Let's read that again. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, you need to be led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons or daughters of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. You become adopted children of God, whereby we cry, Abba, which is the Aramaic uh, form for father. Or some like to say well, it means daddy. It's a, it's a you know, it's a kind term towards your father. And, and um, uh, Abba here. Uh, father, dad, daddy, whatever you want to say here. So you become adopted sons of God by being led by the spirit of God, right? Okay. Now, the deeper doctrine here, right? We have a heavenly father, right? We have a God we worship, right? Okay, so those of you who have ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says here. There's a deep, deep, deep doctrine here about the difference between a heavenly father and a God. So you become adopted sons of God, right? But your children, your spiritual children of the heavenly father. He that hath, hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says here. It's a deep doctrine, Paul. Okay, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that this is true, that we are the children of God through adoption by being led by the spirit of God. And if we become children through adoption, if we become children of God through adoption, then we become hairs, hairs of God. Here we go, another deep doctrine, Paul. Remember, Paul's the doctor of theology. Hairs of God and joint hairs with Christ. Ooh, false evangelical Christians. Oh, you love to deceive people. Oh, you love to attack true Christianity. You love to attack the true Christians, don't you? Everything in the Bible goes against what you're falsely prophesying and what you're falsely teaching. You declare that the true Christians are not Christians because they believe they can become a God. Interesting, right? But what is what is your Paul? Your Paul, 
Oh, your man, your man, this is your man. This is he. You love him more than you love the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You love Paul. What did Paul just say? We better read that again. That's powerful stuff here. Romans 8, verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We become joint heirs with Christ? Well, do you believe that Christ is God? If we become joint heirs with Christ, and there's many passages we can look at here that says that Jesus Christ inherited all things of the Father. So if Jesus Christ inherited all things of the Father, and we become joint heirs of all things with Christ, what does that make us? Think about that. huh? He's saying we'll be equal to God. Equal to Christ. We're going to be equal to Christ. Now watch this. He's going to even take it a step further. He's going to make it clearer for you. You false, the abominable heretics. If it so be that we suffer with Christ, with him, that we may also be glorified together. Glorified as what? God. Jesus is God, right? Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is God. He's inherited all things of the Father. We will receive the one I just said. We will receive all things from the Father and be joint heirs equal to Jesus Christ. We will be equal to your man. Paul, your man just said we will be equal to Jesus Christ. We will inherit all things that Jesus Christ inherited. We will be glorified the same as Jesus Christ. He just said that. Paul, your man, your man, he just contradicted you. You spent millions of dollars. You've written all kinds of books bashing the true Christians for believing such a doctrine. But here it is from your own man. In Romans, all you got to do is read the Bible and you'll know that the stuff you've been taught is a, is, is a bunch of heretical falsehoods. How can we make it more clear than that? Your man, Paul just said, we will become like Jesus Christ. We will become glorified as Jesus Christ. We will inherit all things that Jesus Christ inherited. He said that right here in Romans 8, 17. Are you going to continue to deny that? Are you going to continue to deny that the Bible is the word of God? You like to proclaim you believe the Bible is the word of God. Problem is you either you either don't really believe it or you don't read it. Because when you read it, all the doctrines that it proclaims is totally contrary to what you're out there teaching. You need to repent. You need to repent before you suffer the judgments of God. You can't think you can just spend your life here on earth fighting true Christianity, fighting against the Christians, and you think you're going to somehow be saved. You can't be that delusional, can you? Let's continue on. And then 18, what a beautiful verse here. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Just always remember that as we suffer in life, there's nothing compared to the glories and the happiness and the joy we will one day have. 26 through 28. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we should. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. If you approach prayer, not to memorize prayers like the Catholics do, but if you approach God, open to let the Holy Spirit reveal to you and speak into your heart what you should pray for, then your prayers are going to be much more successful and you're going to be able to obtain a lot more greater blessings than you otherwise would. So what a great verse of scripture. Uh, 31 through 39. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us, right? Just live that as a model of your life. If God is for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us. 
How, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? <laughs> he said it again. He said it again, didn't he? That God will give us all things, making us a God. Do, do angels have all things? No. Do humans have all things? No. So what's greater than a human and what's greater than, than an angel? Jesus Christ, right? What is Jesus Christ? Hey, God, right? <laughs> oh, you poor souls out there fighting against God. It's hard to kick, kick against the pricks, isn't it, as Jesus would say? huh? Here's your own man, your own man contradicting you, your own man making you look silly and ridiculous, your own man exposing you for the false uh, preachers that you are. Right here, right here, all things, all things. He said it again, all things. Okay, let's continue on here. He says, um, 34, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This is another one of the great passages. So tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, separate us being the saints of God. We're the ones God loves. That's in total ag agreement with everything else from Genesis through here. Okay, great. So the more great passages here. Let's look at chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. So he's bearing testimony. What he's saying is true. I lie not. My conscience also bearing... Me witness in the Holy Ghost. Okay, very good. 30 through 33. So keep this in mind. Maybe we should read that again here. Oops. I just lost my just lost my Romans. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, right? The things he just said that he's not telling the lie is that we can become the same as Jesus Christ, <laughs> that we could inherit all things that Jesus Christ, joint heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, glorified together with Jesus Christ as God. <laughs> he just says he does not lie about that. He doesn't lie about it. His conscience bearing witness in the Holy Ghost that what he said is true. Repent, repent, ye false preachers, repent. Okay, let's continue on 30 through 33. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which follow not after righteousness, have attained the righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, had not a law, attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling block, Jesus Christ. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So what he's here saying is that, look, you Jews, we're so busy keeping the 613 commandments, the 300 plus you need to positively be doing, and the 300 things, you, the, the prohibitions that you need to not be doing. You were so worried about that that you forgot to exercise faith in God. So when you saw Jesus Christ come and perform miracles, you didn't even have the ability to exercise your faith in Jesus Christ and that he was the fulfillment of your law of Moses, right? Okay, so that's chapter 9. Moving to chapter 10. 1 through 4 of chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So even though he's the, you know, calling himself the apostle to the Gentiles and he's now preaching to the Gentiles 
uh, he's still, his heart is still that, he's trying to say, look, I still hold hope out for the Jews. We know that the God, they've been, been re they rejected Jesus Christ. God's now going to uh, prefer the Gentiles to receive the gospel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Then the Jews will re again receive the gospel and they, and they can become saved. So uh, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge, right? They have a zeal. They, they want to keep these 613 commandments, but they don't truly know God or they would have recognized Jesus Christ. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, they were bragging to each other how well they could keep the 613 commandments over against other people. Establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law of Moses for righteousness to everyone that believeth. The whole thing in the law of Moses was to lead people to Jesus Christ. The Jews missed that. Okay, 8 through 10. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if that, here we go. Evangelicals, let's let's take a look at one of your scriptures here. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised them from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Oops. <laughs> Oops. We better read that. Evangelicals, <laughs> wake up here. Wake up. Let's let's look at that. Let's look at your passage again. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. <laughs> Oops. So what's the problem here? There's two things you need to do here, don't, isn't there? Number one, you need to confess with your mouth, Jesus. But you need to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That God raised them from the dead. If you don't believe that, this promise doesn't pertain to you and you cannot be saved. But you don't believe that Jesus rose, rose from, was raised from the dead. You believe that Jesus has no body, no parts, no passions. And yet the New Testament is very clear in places such as Luke 24, 15. The resurrected Jesus appeared. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as a seed that I have. So touch me, apostles, and see that I have flesh. And not only that, but I'm going to eat too to prove to you that I rose from the dead. And he ate. And there was many other passages of scriptures in the other gospels too, where Jesus did the same type of thing. And the woman, they held him by the feet. How can they hold him by the feet? That would be a part, right? No body, no parts, no passions. They're holding his feet. He has a body. If he's eating, he has a body. Oh, how the New Testament just again contradicts your false heretical doctrine. No wonder Jesus Christ himself in 1830, when he in 1820, when he appeared to the prophet Joseph, said that their creeds are an abomination in his sight. Your creeds are an abomination in the eyes of Jesus. How does that make you feel? Huh? To know that what you believe is an abomination to Jesus Christ. He considers that abomination. There's no difference between worshiping your false credo trinity than there is to worship the ancient statues of the god Baal or Asherah or Chemish or Molech. Take your pick. They're all the same false gods. Your trinity is a false god. Nowhere is it preached in the gospel that Jesus has no body, no parts, no passions. And in fact, all the way from Genesis 1-1, all the way through the end, God has a body with parts and passions. So you, you need to repent of your sins, reject such false notions. Be upset. Be upset. You've been lied to. You've been lied to. Whether directly by your pastor or whether indirectly with your pastor having been lied to and then turning around, passing that lie on to you, you have been lied to. If you've been preached that your God has no body, no parts, no passions, you have been lied to. 
read the Bible and believe what the Bible says. Then, if you believe, as he says here, if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead, handle me and see a spirit hath not a, bo a body of flesh and bones as you see that I have, then you shall be saved. But if you confess Jesus with your mouth, but don't believe that Jesus was risen from the dead, this verse of scripture does not pertain to you. There's no promise for you. There's no promise. The promise is only for those who believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, so again, Paul. <laughs> Paul, your man, your own guy, continues to contradict your falsehoods that you're preaching from the pulpit. Continues to make you appear to be uneducated and to be the false evil preachers that you really are. Paul. Paul, blame Paul. Don't blame me. I'm not, the, you know, I'm just the messenger here. I'm, I'm just bringing you God's word. I'm just showing you what the Bible actually says. You should try reading it for once in your life. Read it. It goes totally contrary to all your false doctrine. Why, why do you think God had to restore God, his church upon the earth? Because you were believing all kinds of false heresies, false uh, heretical uh, doctrines. That's why God had to restore the truth. If you had been preaching the truth about God, there would have been no need for the restoration. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Okay, so now we continue on and um, on through... And so once again here in 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, you like to quote it and take it out of context, don't you? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But who's the Lord? The one from the scriptures, the biblical Jesus, the one that has a body of flesh and bones and that rose from the dead, just as he said earlier. If you believe that, that Jesus rose from the dead, that's the Jesus you need to believe in for this to have any promise at all in your life. If you don't believe in the biblical Jesus, you don't have this uh, promise. Don't go around deceiving people, giving them false hope, teaching them to believe false gods, and then think that somehow they're going to be saved. They're not going to be saved believing false doctrines. So in verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? That's why God needed to send preachers who hold the priest and authority of God. Watch this. And how should they believe in him of whom they have not heard? If you haven't heard of the true biblical Jesus, how should you believe in him? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent by God? The way that they've always been sent by God. But you did, but your own <laughs> your own preacher says that there's no more revelation. Your preacher, ask him. Ask him, he'll say, oh, no, 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 no. After the Bible, there's no more revelation. So meaning, he has not been called by God. It would take a revelation from God to call him to be a preacher. How else are you going to know that God wants you to be a preacher unless it comes by revelation? So the very fact that they deny that there's revelation that by that very by their very denial, they're admitting to you they're a false preacher. Don't listen to them. Flee from such a false minister, false preacher, false teacher, and get to the truth. Fifteen. And how should they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ and bring the glad tidings of good things. But they have not obeyed the gospel, as Isaiah said, who hath believed our report. So then faith, you want to learn how to build a testimony? Here it is. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, nowadays, they didn't, they didn't have the Bible in their own hands in those days. Nowadays, we also have the Bible, right? So not only can you build testimony by hearing true preachers of God sent by God through revelation, but by reading the scriptures as well, you can gain testimony of the gospel. Uh, 
Okay, so then he says, he says, but I have said, have, have they not heard? Have the Jews not heard the gospel? Yes, verily their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you when you when you the Jews start to see the gospel preached to the Gentiles, start to see them come unto God, start to receive the blessings of the gospel, then you shall be jealous, then you'll want to repent of your sins and turn unto God and receive the blessings. Okay, so. Uh, he'll use that later on about his calling himself an apostle. So, so, so wait for that. He uses that same principle. Okay, now we're going to move on to chapter 11. <clears throat> okay, chapter 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then there is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Okay. So you're saying if by grace, they got to keep it in the context of what he's talking about. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. The works of the law of Moses, not by keeping the Ten Commandments. He has argued over and over again the need to keep the Ten Commandments. He's arguing against keeping the law of Moses. You have to keep that clear in your mind. In Judaism, you by doing the works of the law, the 300 positive things you should be doing, as well as keeping the prohibitions of the law, you work righteousness. You make yourself more and more righteous. That's how it works in Judaism. Christianity, you're righteous until you sin. Then you're no longer righteous until you repent. And then you become righteous again. You have to understand that. You have to keep that in mind. Uh, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? The Jews, if they stumbled, they should fall. God forbid, but rather that through their full, their, through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles, for to provoke the Jews to jealousy. So again, he's trying to teach this concept that now that the Gentiles are going to receive the blessings of God, it's going to provoke the Jews to jealousy, so that they'll want to keep the commandments, so that they will be blessed. <laughs> Thirteen through fourteen, for I speak to you Gentiles. Uh, for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Why? So, so I say, look, I, you know, I'm going, you know, I'm going around calling myself an apostle, and in fact, I'm calling myself an apostle to the Gentiles. Right? They, they haven't called me to be a member of the twelve. You know, I'm not one of the 12 apostles. I'm not the 70. You know, James and I don't get along very well. <laughs> he, he, he views me as a heretic, an apostate. You know, I, you know I, I keep wondering why he's weak in the faith and why he can't abandon this law of Moses. He says, nevertheless, I started going around at the beginning of the Romans. I'm, in my greeting in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, I now am calling myself an apostle. He says, I do that. And then I work hard to magnify my office. Later in Corinthians, he's going to say, I worked harder than any of the 12 apostles. So he says, I speaking to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle Gentiles, I magnify my office. I'm calling myself an apostle to the Gentiles, and I work hard at, at doing that. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, it might save some of them. I'm doing this so that I may provoke James, uh, Paul, uh, the James. Peter and John, the first presidency of the church, and the 12 apostles and the 70, as well as all the Jewish Christians, to once and for all abandon the law of Moses, just worry about keeping the Ten Commandments and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's why I'm going around calling myself an apostle to the Gentiles. 
working harder than all of them, having greater success than any of them, building up more congregations than any of them, so that I can provoke them that they'll be jealous of me, so that they will finally get rid of this law of Moses. And therefore, maybe they'll be some of them might be saved. Okay, so that's what that's about there. Uh, 22 through 29, he says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward the goodness. And again, false doctrine being preached today. God just loves everybody, just tolerant of everybody. Scriptures, once again, proving that's wrong. He's very severe, Paul says, in his judgments on the wicked but he's full of mercy and love towards those who do their best to keep his commandments. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise, and it's conditional, only if you continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. You know, God will still allow the Jews to become be grafted right back onto the tree. For God is able to graft them in again. For if that were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So, We've seen that before, that if somebody rejects the gospel, God causes them to be blind for a period of time. That's their punishment. God has blinded them so they can't recognize Jesus Christ even now, 2,000 years later, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Then he'll release that blindness and they can once again see and make a decision whether they want to accept Jesus as their long-promised Messiah. And so all Israel at that point of time shall be saved. Again, not necessarily in the celestial kingdom. Saved just simply means from the lowest level of the telestial kingdom, which is a degree of glory and the salvation, all the way up to the highest level of the celestial kingdom. This is Paul's 1 Corinthians 15, the glory of the stars, the minimal stars up into the glory of the sun. They shall all be saved at that point of time. The Jews shall all be saved in some degree of glory at that point of time. For this is my covenant unto them. I've already made that covenant to them that they shall be saved in a degree of glory. A lot of that was based on what they did in the pre-existence, where apparently they were really good and they really did their best to honor God there. So he's looked at to that and taken that into account. It says, um, for this my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes right now. They persecute you, say bad things about you. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now, that's not the best translation. Uh, um, the more better translation is that the gifts and calling their God, you know, are without revoke. He will not take it away, right? What he's promised people uh, in terms of gifts and callings, he will not take away from them. Okay, so that's chapter 11. Let's look at chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. How? Holy, meaning you're doing righteous things. You're not just accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior and going out and getting drunk the next night, right? That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So, again, another contradiction to your false heretical doctrine, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself 
more highly than he ought to think. You know, stay humble. Don't get prideful. But to think soberly, according to, as God hath dwelt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, so God has given to all the different church members different gifts, different graces. Whether prophecy, those who have the, the gift to prophesy, let them prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, if that's your gift, minister. Or he that teacheth, teach. Or he that exhorteth, exhort. He or she that have the, the gift to give, give. Let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Again, you don't have to just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have to cleave to the good and do that which is good. Interesting. He is so contradictory to your false doctrine. Be kindly affectionate, affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honoring. Prefer one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given the hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but can condescend to man of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit, conceit. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peacefully with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Now, obviously, it looks like Joseph Smith missed this one in the Joe Smith translation. The spirit would have had him at least say something like, but rather give not place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So try not to be angry. Just let the Lord take care of it. The Lord, Vengeance is the Lord's. He'll take care of it for you. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. You would think, well, that's crazy, right? Why would you do that? Watch this. By so doing, you are condemning them. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. So how do you do with your enemies? You want God to take vengeance on them? You treat them nice. You feed them. You you th you give them drink. You take good, you try to take good care of them. And you are heaping, you'll be heaping coals of fire on their head and God will take vengeance on them. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. <laughs> Okay, chapter 13. Let's look at verse 9. For and here we go. <laughs> let's take a let's take a sip of water here and get ready, evangelicals. <laughs> He's, your man's coming after you again. Oh, you gotta love Paul, don't you? Romans 13, verse. Nine, here we go, evangelical Christians. How dare you call yourself such? For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Ah, interesting. He's starting to name the Ten Commandments. Isn't this interesting? For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this say, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. <laughs> Interesting, right? There he goes. He started naming the Ten Commandments. He'd been alluding to it the whole time. All the way through his letter, he kept saying he needed to live a righteous life by keeping the commandments, the Ten Commandments. Here he actually starts naming the Ten Commandments as further proof of what he's trying to say here. Oh, you false, abominable heretics, you need to repent of your sins and come unto the true Christian church. Luckily, at the end of the video, we're going to have a link in this in the in the description of this video to click on 
to work with the missionaries to become a member of Jesus Christ True Christian Church. Flee your false heretical forms of Christianity. Come into what Paul teaches and what the New Testament teaches and what the Bible teaches. True biblical Christianity. Okay, so let's go then to verse 12, 12 through 14. False heretical. Listen, here we go again. That night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. We need to keep the Ten Commandments just as I started naming them in verse 9. Let us walk honestly. Oh, we got to do. We this we got to do, right? We got to do it. And that didn't just say you just have to believe in Jesus. No, Paul never said that, did he? We've already covered this in a couple of hours, uh, what, an hour and a half last week. Uh, we're getting close to an hour here again of going through Romans. Just absolutely, Paul absolutely dismantling and destroying false evangelical, modern day evangelical. Christianity, absolutely false uh, religion from Satan. It is not Christianity. It is not true in any way. It's totally contrary to everything that your own man said. Not only is it contrary to the Bible, not only contrary to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Genesis, you know, we go all the way through, but it's actually against what your own man, your own man Paul is saying, your champion. Oh, has got to be disappointing when you actually read the Bible and see what your own man, Paul, says. It's got to be disappointing to find everything that you've been told is a lie. Everything you've been told in your false form of Christianity is a lie. It's a lie. You've been lied to. You've been lied to. You have every right to be angry with your minister, with your pastor, be very upset. They've put your salvation at risk. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. You can't, you can't say you believe in Jesus and go do those things and think you're going to be saved. It's, it's false, heretical, false doctrine coming from Satan himself. He has misled you. He has lied to you. He's convinced your pastors to lie to you too because they love him more than they love the Jesus uh, of the Bible, more than they love Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's 100% for sure there. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You have to keep the Ten Commandments. You don't need to do the works of the law, Moses. You don't need to keep the law of Moses. You do have to keep the Ten Commandments. That's what Paul's been preaching over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You're a man. I keep pointing out to you so you hopefully uh, the light bulb goes off in your head at some point and say, your own man is, fault, is, is completely 100% in contradiction to your pastor. How does that make you feel? That your own pastor is totally contradicting Paul. He doesn't believe in Paul. He gives lip service to Paul. He likes to quote some of these passages. He doesn't believe Paul. He doesn't believe in Paul. He doesn't believe the gospel that Paul's presenting here. And Paul said, even if an angel from heaven comes and teaches any other gospel, if an angel from God, if an angel comes down from heaven and proclaims to you that you can somehow just believe in Jesus without keeping the Ten Commandments. Let that angel be cursed, Paul says in Galatians 1.8. Should we read that? We better read that. We're going to get to that when we get to Galatians. But maybe based on everything we've been looking at the last two weeks here, maybe it's a good time to also uh, start looking at that great scripture. Maybe we should be quoting that quite a bit. There seems to be a lot of wisdom and uh, here in uh, Galatians uh, chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 8 here. But Paul speaking once again, here, here we go, Galatians 1.8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, 
let him be a curse. Let him be damned. Let that angel be damned. Let that angel go to hell. Let it be cursing upon that angel if he preaches anything other than what I've just preached to you, which is to believe in Jesus Christ and to keep the Ten Commandments that you don't need to keep the law of Moses. You don't need to do the 300 works of the law of Moses to make yourselves righteous. You have to keep the Ten Commandments. You have to live a righteous life. You have to stop sinning. He said that over and over and over again here. He said, if an angel comes down from heaven and tells you anything other than that, let that angel be accursed, be cursed, and be damned if that angel would say something like that. Pretty powerful, pretty powerful words from your man, your man, the one you love, Paul. You proclaim all this lip service, all this lip recognition, lip confession to Paul as your great apostle. Okay, so that's chapter 13. Now we'll look at chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. <laughs> here we go. Paul, back back at it again. Here we go. Chapter 14 here, he's going to make a couple attacks on James, the president of the church. Now again, James, the brother of Jesus. A lot of people don't even know. <laughs> Whereas, unfortunately, a lot of people don't even know <laughs> that Jesus had a brother. Uh, number two, they didn't know that his brother's name is James. And number three, they didn't know that he was the leader of the church. How unfortunate for James, but nevertheless, that's what the entire New Testament teaches. That's what uh, all the early church fathers say. Uh, that's what all the non-canonical uh, uh, gospels say, especially like the gospel of Thomas. Apostles ask, well, who should we go to now that Jesus has died? <laughs> now that you, Lord, has died, Jesus himself says, go to James, for whose sake even heaven and earth came into existence. Right? <laughs> but nevertheless... You know, you've been believed that you've been taught this traditional Catholic stuff that somehow Peter was the head. He may have, in some sense, been a chief apostle in the sense maybe he was served as maybe he served as like president of the quorum of the twelve or or something like that. But he, but James, the brother of Jesus, which is why Paul is continuing to attack James, and that's why he's when we saw this multiple times in Acts. When we get to Galatians chapter two. Yeah, maybe since we looked at Galatians 1 8, we'll look at Galatians 2 here too, because we're going to get even a lot more of this coming up. So if we look at Galatians chapter 2, he says here, verse 9, and when James, interesting, right? When James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, right? So the three were what? Not Peter, James, and John, as we see, you know, as in, in the Gospels, it just says Jesus keep bringing Peter, James, and John. And this is James, the brother of John, a fisherman, uh, aside for special, uh, you know, missions, special healings, and so forth. That's all it really talks about, Peter, James, and John. So a lot of people from that make some wild assumption about James, but we get the the pillars of the church, the three pillars. The presidency of the church is who? James, president. Cephas, the Aramaic form for Peter as first counselor, and John, second counselor. Remember, James, the brother of of of, uh, of uh, James, the brother of John, was killed uh, back in um, you know Acts twelve. So uh, this is James, the brother of Jesus who's the head of the church. We've seen that over and over again. We saw it in Acts. He's the one that made the decision to take the gospel to the Gentiles. My decision is he's the one that sent out the letter signed by him, not signed by Peter, not John, you know, and so forth. Anyways, there's tons and tons of evidence, all the early church fathers, all the non-canonical, uh, the gospels and so forth. So anyways, uh, we come back here. And so here we go. He's going to attack James, the president of the church here. Watch this. 14, chapter 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Can you imagine someone taking take it on, Russell M. Nelson like that, right? Saying he's weak in the faith. He just said that James is weak in the faith. We know from the 
from the Jewish historian Josephus. We know from the early church fathers. We know from the New Testament and Acts and so forth that James did not eat meat, right? James did not eat meat. He didn't want anybody to eat meat. He was, uh, he was a lifelong uh, vegetarian. He ate vegetables. He ate herbs. Uh, you know, when when he finally let the, the Gentiles receive the gospel, he still tried to demand that they don't eat meat. He tried to disguise it as well. You can't eat things strangled or sacrificed to idols, but all meat was being sacrificed to the idols in the Gentile world. So therefore, he's basically saying don't eat meat. We made it so you can't because you can't find any meat that has not been sacrificed to an idol. So here, here Paul is calling James and the 12 apostles who are with him and still trying to keep the law of Moses and the dietary laws of the book of Moses, uh, of the law of Moses, calling them weak in the faith. They're the, weeks in the weak ones in the faith. Later, he's going to call himself the strong one in the faith, right? So, so him that is weak in the faith, when, when the 12 apostles come, to speak to your congregation there in Rome, go ahead and receive, but, you know, try not to, you know, deal with their doubtful disputations, right? <laughs> They're going to come in and tell you after me not to eat meat, you know, but, uh, you know, he says, for one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. <laughs> if you're If you're weak in the Christian faith, then you're going to, and not eat meat, right? If you're strong in the faith, you can go ahead and eat meat because you know that an idol is nothing. And so therefore, if meat sacrificed to an idol, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but if you're weak in the faith, you're not going to eat meat, right? So you're you're weak. You know, James, the president of the church, is weak in the faith. Imagine some of Con Russell and Nelson, weak, <laughs> weak in the faith. And, and uh, Henry Eyring and the Down H. Oaks, you know, they're weak in the faith. Okay, because because they eat herbs. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. So it says, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. You know, I wish that we would just do away with this argument about eating, whether to eat meat or not. Let's just do away with the argument. Don't despise those who refuse to eat. And those of you who, who refuse to eat, don't despise those who do eat, choose uh, to eat meat. For God hath received both of you, right? Okay, so that's 14, and we'll continue on to 8 through 17. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Nothing unclean. You don't need to worry about whether this animal is unclean to eat. You don't need to worry about any of that. But to him that eat, esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him, it is unclean. If you think something's wrong and you do it, you're committing wrong, right? But if thy brother be greed with thy meat, if he's upset or offended that you're eating meat, now walkest thou not charitably, right? You don't want to cause your brother to be offended and hurt because you're eating meat. So don't eat it in his presence, basically, right? Just eat it when he's not around. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died, right? You don't want to hurt his testimony if he sees you eating meat. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Now, here we go, James. James, James, James and the, your counselors, James, Peter, and John in the Quorum of the Twelve, in the Seventy, here you go. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. The kingdom of God is not... Whether you're eating meat or what you're drinking has nothing to do with what you eat or drink. But the kingdom of God is 100% based on what? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of man. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify one another for meat destroy not the work of god all things indeed are pure but as evil for that man who eateth with offense so here we go again I, uh, uh, 21 it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or his offenders made weak so don't do it in their present if you're going to hurt their if you're going to hurt their testimony Faith. 
Okay, so here we go. So that's chapter 14, and then we'll look at 15, chapter uh, verse 1. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. 15, 1. We then, Paul, right? Paul's saying this, right? We then that are strong in the faith ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and ought to please ourselves, right? <clears throat> so James and the Quorum of the Twelve are weak in the faith. I, Paul, uh, call, going around calling myself an apostle, uh, but he does have Jesus Christ backing 2,000 years later once again. Remember, Jesus says in Doctrine and Covenants, Paul by an apostle. So he's, he's not just you know going around delusional calling himself an apostle. He knows that Jesus Christ has called him to go preach his gospel. He is Jesus Christ's apostle. And it doesn't matter what Paul, what James thinks of him. It doesn't matter what Paul, what John, what any of the 12, one of the 70 uh, think about Paul. Jesus Christ views him as his apostle. He's satisfied with that relationship. He's going forth to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's very hurt. They never call him. And I think that's why you get this hostility a lot of times, too. But they're also making, making they're creating more hostility, but then going around after Paul and then trying to refute and, and go against everything that Paul just said in that congregation. So they made it difficult for him. Okay, so 15.1. Now we look at verse 4. For whatsoever things were written, written aforetime, were written for our learning. The things in the scriptures are written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And 15 through 21. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ, the Gentiles. And this then he backs back down from apostle here, doesn't it? At first, he's saying he's an apostle, and that the reason I'm going around claiming myself to be a, an apostle to the Gentiles is to make James and the Twelve all jealous so that maybe they'll work harder, and maybe they'll finally do away with this law of Moses, and maybe they'll actually start to eat meat so that they're not weak in the faith, and they can become strong in the faith and have a stronger testimony of Jesus Christ and view that Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law and that the law of Moses all pointed to Jesus Christ. So he backs down from apostle here to just that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ and those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fullness, the truth, not just the partial gospel of Jesus Christ, the full truth of Jesus Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. Now watch this, this is interesting. Not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation, right? I purposely took the gospel to lands and countries and cities where they had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, never even heard of Jesus Christ. So what a great thing uh, that was there. He took the gospel and laid a foundation where the gospel had not yet been, been preached. It's certainly been one of my joys in life through our online ministry these past few years to have been able to see so many people uh, receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, once again, where it has not been preached in lands and countries and nations where the gospel, the church can't even be organized yet. You know, that people are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ today, uh, fortunately through the, the blessing that God has put on my life to carry the gospel to you. Just as Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and to the people who had, had not heard of Jesus Christ in his own day, so that you don't build upon some other's foundation, but you're laying the foundation for the gospel to be able to go there in its fullness in the future. 
Okay, so one again, once again, 20, yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. And what a great blessing that is. Okay, so now we go to chapter 16, and we'll look at 17 through 20. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division. So he still can't leave James and the 12 alone here, can he? He just wants to come back with, with another attack. So now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Right? Earlier he said to receive them, right? Receive them with without dispute, you know, without disputations, right? But now he's like, well, the more I think about it, just just don't even receive them, just, just reject them, right? And again, we take this as a modern day uh, application, and you reject those false ministers, those false teachers, those false pastors, those false missionaries, those who preach the creeds of a false heretical Christianity, you reject them and you don't receive them, as he says here, you avoid them. For they that are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are preaching to you that God has no body, no parts, no passions, that preach this false Trinity creed, Trinitarian creeds of false Christianity, those who preach that, Paul says, that they do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, they're out to deceive the hearts of the simple. You, you, those who are good in heart, they're out to deceive you, to take your money through donations, to lead you astray, to seek power so that you view them as some sort of powerful preacher of God and give them respect that they don't deserve. And honor that they don't reserve that they don't deserve. That's why they do it. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. Remember, he said earlier, your church in Rome is well spoken of throughout the world. I'm glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Then he continues with some greetings here. And in 25 through 27. Now the hymn that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. The gospel. Interesting now, right? That's the reason he, again, is what we've looked at earlier. That's why he said, that's why he calls it my gospel, right? The one I'm preaching. Not the one that James and the Quorum of the Twelve are preaching. My gospel. Therefore, I am going to say in Galatians, coming up, right? Whether James shows up, whether Peter shows up, whether the Twelve show up, and they teach a gospel other than what I'm preaching to you, or even if an angel comes down from heaven and preaches a gospel different than what I'm preaching to you. Let that angel, let the president of the church, let, let the Quorum of the Twelve be cursed, be damned, if they preach a gospel different than what I'm preaching to you. So here he's trying to fo focus it again. My gospel, the one that I'm preaching, not the one that James is about to preach. He's sending his own guys, right? He's going to be sending his own 70 here, his apostles here. He's going to send them. I've just preached to you the gospel here in this letter. I've sent it off to Rome. Now they're going to go to Rome, and they're going to try to dispute and, and, and contradict everything I just said. And they're going to teach you to try to keep the law of Moses and that you shouldn't be eating meat because they're weak in faith, as he says here, and that you have to keep the law of Moses. <clears throat> okay. So here he says, my gospel, the preaching, uh, according to the revelation, uh, let's see. Now to him that is the power established you according to my gospel, the one that I'm preaching. I'm the only one preaching it. The 12 are not preaching this. The first presidency is not preaching this. The seven are not preaching this. I'm preaching this. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which is kept secret since the world began, 
right? They always taught that Jesus Christ would come forth from the beginning of the world to one day atone for the sins of mankind. But now it's made manifest very clearly now, right? Not just through Old Testament prophecy, but now having come, we actually have the stories about Jesus and how he lived his life and the miracles he performed. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. <clears throat> to God only wise <clears throat> be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. What a powerful lesson that Paul, the apostle, according to God, preached here. Again, doesn't matter what James thought of him. Doesn't matter what Peter thought of him. Doesn't matter what John thought of him. Doesn't matter what the 12 thought of him. Doesn't matter what the 70 thought of Paul. They viewed him as an heretic. They viewed him as an apostate. God himself declared Paul his apostle. Maybe we should continue to look at that multiple times as we continue through Paul's letters. God speaking to the prophet Joseph Smith. Nearly 2,000 years later, after Paul, Doctrine and Covenants, Section 18, speaking unto Oliver Cowdery and unto David Whitmer, Behold, I command all men everywhere to repent, and I speak unto you, even as unto Paul, mine apostle, for you are called with the same calling with which he was called. So Paul, his apostle. Right, so keep that in mind. I know he's going against the 12, I know he's going against first presidency. Paul's Christianity wins out. We don't keep the law of Moses in Christianity today, do we? Can you name any church that keeps the law of Moses? I don't know of any, right? As far as we know, there's certainly no major Christian sect, Christian religion, uh, keeps the law of Moses. That's because of Paul. If it had not been for Paul, we'd all be. Still under the bondage of sin, as Paul said, right? We'd still be under the bondage of, of the of this law of Moses. We'd have to be worrying about 613 different commandments every day of our life, the 300 plus that we should be doing, including how many steps on the Sabbath you can take, uh, how you wash your hands, if you wash your hands in the proper ceremonial fashion before eating, what, uh, and then having debates about whether you're allowed to defecate on the Sabbath day, whether you're able to defecate in Jerusalem. We'd be holding discussions like that today in, in our Christian churches if it had not been for the Apostle Paul. Paul was able to recognize before the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve and the Seventy that Jesus had come to fulfill the law of Moses, that there was no reason to continue to have to burden ourselves with keeping the law of Moses. We have to keep the Ten Commandments. He even started naming from memory the Ten Commandments, as we saw earlier, right? Keep that in mind. He's preached over and over again, you need to live a righteous life. It's not just enough to proclaim Jesus that is your Lord and Savior and think that you can just go live your life however you want. He has contradicted that false doctrine dozens and dozens of times as we looked at the last couple of weeks here. For those of you who are not yet members of God's true church upon the earth, the true Christian church, the true Christian religion, we invite you a special invitation from the Lord to come unto him, to come unto the missionaries of his church, to receive the fullness of the gospel truth. Click on the link within the description of this video. That will take you to where you can fill out information so that you can be contacted by the missionaries of his church so that they can help you and prepare you to become a full member, a full Christian, one chosen by God, elected from before the foundation of the world to be one of his chosen sons of God, daughters of God, saints, Christians upon the earth and in the eternities to come. We invite you to walk that path back to God. For those of you who have fallen in activity in the church, we welcome you with full open arms to come on back. Come on back to full activity with the saints. Be one with the community of the saints of God. Reach out to your neighbor, your friend, your elders quorum, 
your Relief Society, your bishop, missionaries, whoever you can. Reach out to them. Ask them for help to come back to the church. Again, in closing, we testify once again of the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is simple. It is wonderful. It is beautiful. I testify that Jesus was our Lord and Savior, the Savior of mankind. Of him, we testify this day and ask God's blessings poured out upon you that you have safe shelter overhead, that you may have good health, that you may have food to eat, that you may have the basic monetary resources to carry out God's plan for your lives and that you may be a light and an example to those you come in contact with. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.